Hello everyone. Welcome to the webinar. Uh, we are going to be talking about the RBNZ monetary policy announcement and uh, we are going to be um, both looking at setups ahead of the release as well as um, looking at uh, the actual outcome. We're going to look through the policy statement and uh, attempt to get a sense for exactly what is um, going on here. Uh, but uh, before we uh, launch deeper into the conversation, if you guys could please type into the chat box that uh, I've opened up next uh, to the video screen there, and let me know if you can hear me, and let me know if the uh, video is coming through okay for you. So one more time guys, if you are able to hear me and if you are able to see the uh, charts on the screen, just type into the chat box there. Let me know if that is working for you and we will begin. Okay, excellent. So it looks like we are good to go. So let's begin first with a conversation about um, the probabilities uh, that uh, we have ahead of this announcement uh, and what they mean for the likely outcome. So first and foremost, we are looking at a heavily skewed positioning uh, here ahead of this announcement. Uh, the markets imply a 100% um, chance of at least a 25 basis point cut and a slight possibility of a 50 basis point cut. So the overwhelming view here is dramatically, dramatically dovish. Now, that obviously suggests that if the RB and Z were to actually cut rates, and if they were to do it by 25 basis points, nobody would really be particularly surprised. The surprise could come from, in that case, uh, a variety of p 
places and of course a surprise would be needed to make for a market moving announcement if uh, the markets already see a 100 percent uh, probability that uh, there is going to be a cut then that is almost certainly baked into exchange rates to a pretty significant extent. I wouldn't say all the way baked in because anytime that something goes from um, speculation and becomes reality there is a degree of um, repricing that occurs. So I wouldn't say that necessarily there is um, not going to be a move lower at all in the event that there's a cut, that it's already all the way priced in, but I wouldn't expect that move to be lasting um, whatsoever if all we got from the RBNZ was just a cut. The larger issue uh, would be um, if the statement that the RBNZ issues in conjunction with any sort of cut does not materially match established expectations. Now, as it stands, the markets see at least one more RBNZ cut in play after this one over the coming um, the coming 12 months. So in other words, uh, the market sees the RBNZ cutting this time and at least one more time between now and uh, this time next year with a slight possibility that actually they're going to do a little bit more. In fact, as it stands, the markets envision 67 basis points in easing over the next 12 months. That's a little bit more than 50, so a little bit more than a pair of cuts, this one and another, but not quite 75, which would imply three cuts, this one and two more thereafter. So the critical thing that we're going to be watching here is the tone of the language. If the tone of the language is aggressively dovish, then perhaps the markets will be more so convinced that the RBNZ will do two cuts after this one versus one, but that's a pretty granular adjustment. It's an adjustment at the market, uh, at the margin. And so we're probably not going to get a tremendous amount of follow through in the subsequent weeks and months on that basis, or at least on that basis alone. The larger surprise here is that the markets have it wrong, or the, the larger surprise risk is that the markets have it wrong. That maybe the RBNZ does deliver a cut, but maybe the rhetoric that they deliver is going to be far less dovish than implications of one, maybe two cuts in the at some uh, at some point in the second half of this year, first half of next year, would envision. So maybe the rhetoric actually suggests that there isn't a sustained rate cut cycle that is going to emerge following this meeting. And if that's the case, then the situation b becomes a lot more interesting because that really would surprise investors. 
So here we go. Here comes the announcement. You can see the Aussie was trading a bit higher over the past days and actually hit the highest uh, level here in almost a month, although it's in retreat now, on the expectation that indeed surprise risk was skewed to the upside. Initial trend line resistance 72.30 followed by 72.98 which is this swing high here so broadly call it the 73 figure and of course we're going to cover the statement as it crosses the wires just seconds away here okay and so we have a cut as expected so we've gone from 2.25 percent down to two percent and let's zoom in here on uh, the shorter term chart for the Kiwi and as you can see as we talked about after a very brief dip the Kiwi dollar is racing higher Again, even though we have a cut, the Kiwi dollar is heading upward. And so what we're going to do here is we're going to go through the policy statement and we are going to see what has been the language that has inspired this. Not surprisingly, the RBNZ website is loading a bit slowly because surely all of us are basically trying to do exactly the same thing is open up th th this website and pull up this policy statement so give it just a moment here but clearly the markets dovish uh, projections are not being met here. So here's the policy statement. I'll give you guys the link to that as well so that we can follow it together. And one guess says it makes no sense. It makes absolutely perfect sense. In fact, I've been uh, writing about it for the past 48 hours talking about w why this would makes this would make sense I'll give you guys some links so here is uh, the preview article I wrote yesterday and here is the uh, preview article that I wrote the day before. So, both of them explaining why the Kiwi was strengthening into this announcement and why the risk would be that it would strengthen further once the cut came. So let's read this policy statement. We'll start from the, uh, the bottom. That generally tends to be uh, where the key point is. Uh, so last paragraph here, monetary policy will continue to be accommodative. 
Our current projections and assumptions indicate that further policy easing will be inquired to uh, ensure that further inflation uh, or that that future inflation settles near the middle of the target range. We will continue to watch closely the emerging economic data. In other words, no clear deviation here from the policy statement as uh, it was delivered last month. For a few months now, the RBNZ has been saying that further easing will be required. And the rhetoric is largely unchanged. So not really a strong signal here suggesting that the RBNZ is ramping things up in any sort of way. So let's, um, let's keep reading here. Headline inflation is being held below the target band by continuing negative tradables inflation. Annual CPI inflation is expected to weaken in the September quarter, reflecting lower fuel prices and cuts in ACC levies. Annual inflation is expected to rise from the December quarter, reflecting the policy stimulus to date, the strength of the domestic economy, reduced drag from tradables inflation, and rising non-tradables inflation. Although long-term inflation expectations are well anchored at 2%, the sustained weakness in headline inflation risks further declines in inflation expectations. In other words, the RBNZ is laying out a case here for saying we expect things to gradually improve already by the end of this year. Now, what that means, essentially, in practice, if the RBNZ expects that inflation is going to be rising in the December quarter, that essentially near-term easing is broadly off the table at least for the next meeting, at least in September. If the RBNZ is saying we are not uh, going to see inflation rising until the December quarter, the subtext is when they meet on September t 22nd, they're not going to cut again. Maybe then they could uh, cut again uh, in uh, November, but that seems unlikely b because New Zealand has a, uh, a quarterly CPI report and December quarter uh, CPI data is not going to be available until early 2017. So in other words, what this suggests is that further easing is essentially off the table for the RBNZ through the rest of this year. Let's keep going. House price inflation remains excessive and has become more broad-based across the regions, adding to concerns about financial stability. The bank is consulting on stronger macroprudential measures that should help to mitigate financial system risks arising from the tepid escalation, or rapid escalation, rather. Uh, that seems to make a lot more sense, doesn't it? Uh, In-house prices. Now, this, of course, is again a case against cutting rates further. What the RBNZ is telling us here is that we have a situation whereby the housing market continues to be buoyant 
and prices continue to rise aggressively despite the macro prudential measures that the RBNZ has already taken. Now, obviously, cutting rates would reduce the cost of borrowing, which would only stoke further b uh, the already buoyant housing market that clearly the central bank is expressing concern about. Right? They're clearly saying, we think this is a risk for financial stability. What happens if you cut rates? Borrowing to finance the purchase of a home becomes cheaper. More people are going to do it. So the price of housing will only rise further, which would presumably exacerbate the risks that are posed by the... Uh, the housing crisis that the RBNZ or we'll say the housing bubble it's not quite a crisis yet the bubble hasn't popped so far anyway but it would certainly exacerbate the risks posed by the bubble as it's building so again what this is suggesting is that the RBNZ is consulting on further macro prudential measures, but while those measures go through consultation, uh, while they settle on which measures they're going to use, while they figure out how they're going to use them, while they implement them, while they wait for them to work and show if, if there is in fact an effect following implementation, This is a bunch of time that's likely to pass there. So again, delaying further cuts. Because what the RBNZ needs to happen is for these macro prudential measures to actually work and begin to cool the housing market before they can go and cut further because they need to essentially be able to make sure that if they were to cut that this is not go uh, going to make the housing market into a greater stability risk let's keep reading uh, domestic growth is expected to remain supported by strong inward migration construction activity tourism and accommodative monetary policy However, low dairy prices are depressing incomes in the dairy sector and reducing farm spending and investment. High net immigration is supporting strong growth in labor supply and limiting wage pressure. So in other words, they're sort of outlining the case for why inflation is low and which uh, risks uh, that we talked about earlier um, appear in the tradable sector when they're talking about dairy what they're essentially talking about is a commodity that amounts to 30 percent of New Zealand exports a little bit more actually so what we're essentially getting here is just an explanation of this is why inflation is low Weak global conditions and low interest rates relative to New Zealand are placing upward pressure on the New Zealand dollar exchange rate. The trade weighted exchange rate is significantly higher than assumed in the June statement. The high exchange rate is adding further pressure to the export and import competing sectors and together with low global inflation is causing negative inflation in the tradable sector. This makes it difficult for the bank to meet its inflation objective. A decline in the exchange rate is needed. So it's funny that, of course, in response to a statement like that, the Kiwi dollar rallies. Because clearly, they can't really do anything about this. They're essentially, and reasonably, laying out uh, the case that uh, global 
monetary easing is very aggressive. Easing in New Zealand has been relatively more tepid. I mean, consider Japan has negative rates, Europe has negative rates, the U.S. can't make it more than 25 basis points above zero, uh, Switzerland has negative rates, and rates in virtually every other G10 economy are lower than they are in New Zealand. So not surprisingly, the Kiwi is more attractive. And not surprisingly as well that, that, that this is complicating efforts to boost inflation because a stronger currency necessarily depresses the price of things in terms of that currency. And so a fall in the price level is, of course, disinflationary. All right, last paragraph from the bottom or first paragraph from the top. Uh, global growth is below trend despite being supported by unprecedented levels of monetary stimulus. Significant surplus capacity remains across many economies and along with low commodity prices is suppressing global inflation. Some central banks have eased policy further since the June monetary policy statement and long-term interest rates are at record lows. The prospects for global growth and commodity prices remain uncertain. Political risks are also heightened. So essentially all the things that we knew. But clearly the picture that the RBNZ is painting here is one where they would like to ease further. They need to ease further. But their inflation outlook envisions that they won't have data t to support doing this probably through the rest of this year. And they are seeing their hands tied by continued buoyancy in the housing market and they're going to attempt to figure out a uh, stronger macro potential effort to take care of that so that they can have the door open for more easing but it remains to be seen when that actually is going to happen so, so in other words, what uh, the takeaway here is is that the markets were looking for signals confirming a sustained easing cycle, and they didn't get it. And so not surprisingly, the Kiwi dollar is higher. Let's take a look at the daily chart here, and you can see that uh, at this point, the pair is on pace to take out this falling trend line resistance and is testing the double top up here near the 73 figure. So we're going to have to watch this and see if this is going to hold as some kind of a topping uh, setup or if indeed we are going to get a break over the next uh, 24 hours. I'm looking for that break to be confirmed on a daily closing basis then we'll see if it is confirmed where things progress from here one way that we could look at potential subsequent levels is we could look at a fib expansion like this where this is the dominant advance this is the correction and this is resumption. And if that's the case, then uh, we can sort of guesstimate here that if we can clear resistance in the 72.76 to 72.98 area, so about the 73 figure, the next level of significance is 73.53. If we take a little bit of a longer term view, 
and we actually say this is the dominant advance right here and this is the correction let's introduce some of these smaller levels back into the equation then you can see that near-term resistance is basically in the 73 to 73 to 25 area and the next big level 74.40 alright thank you everybody for joining me fortunately we are out of time here so we will wrap things up if you would like to follow up w with me by all means feel free to ask any further questions via twitter at Ilya Spivak if you would like to sign up for my email distribution list and receive my analysis directly, such as the articles I was posting earlier, explaining why this was likely to happen even though there was a cut, you can sign up there. It is, of course, absolutely free. Once again, thank you for joining. Good luck out there. Take care.